fifteenth two thousand twenty two this is ford pinellas good afternoon and welcome to our september meeting and will please first start with our invocation and pledge from commissioner edgar's today let me turn the speaker on dear heavenly father uh, thank you for this beautiful rainy day in this incredible Pinellas County. As we come together, may we leave, uh, have open minds to each other's thoughts while we deliberate the business of, of the residents of Pinellas County. These are not easy times as many of our residents struggle to make ends meet. Please be with each family as they search for better jobs, for higher paying jobs. Be with our universities, our business owners, and our government leaders as we search for the answers to connect residents with the right jobs at the right time and the right place. We ask all of this in your name. Amen. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Commissioner Edgars. Tina, if there are any citizens wishing to be heard on any item not already on the agenda for action by the board today, would you please call them? Madam Chair, did you want to do introductions before we get to that? I certainly could. Let's start <laughs> with uh, Commissioner Mertz. Well, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Commissioner Cliff Mertz from the City of Safety Harbor, representing the communities of Safety Harbor, Oldsmar, and Tarpon Springs. Good afternoon, Councilmember Brandy Gabbard, City of St. Petersburg. Karen Seal, Pinellas County, and I was just signing my retirement paper, so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Councilwoman Patty Reed for the City of Pinellas Park. Bonnie Noble, Councilmember of Kennesaw City, um, representing the inland communities. Julie Ward Bajalski, Mayor of the Great City of Dunedin. Councilmember Gina Driscoll, City of St. Petersburg, and representing PSTA. Michael Smith, Vice Mayor, City of Largo. Dave Eggers, County Commissioner, good afternoon. Good afternoon, David Albert, Executive Good afternoon, Whit Blanton, Executive Director. Cookie Kennedy, Mayor of the City of Indian Rocks Beach, representing the beach communities. Richie Floyd, Council Members. District 8, St. Petersburg. Thank you, everyone. And Tina, citizens to be heard. Madam Chair, we do have one citizen asking to be heard today, and that's Gail Conroy. Gail, would you like to come forward? And Gail, you'll have three minutes. Well, hello. Um, I'm so happy to see so many people and so many communities represented here today. It's, uh, it's a good time to talk. Um, I'm a beekeeper here in Pinellas County. I keep my bees at Chester Oaks Park. I also have some bees at my home in Reddington Shores. Um, Monday, I lost another beehive, and it was to um, Garland Poor. Um, if you're familiar with the pesticides that the communities around here use, it's a very, very, uh, very bad one. It, uh, it kills the bees, but it takes about six weeks before they die. Um, you really don't know they're dying necessarily. You might get a clue, but um, the babies just starve to death because the food they eat from the trees, um, it kills them. It's poisonous. Um, this this uh, pesticide, tri trichlorophyll, is being used randomly throughout the county. Um, and it's something that we really, really need to take a better look at. And, you know, we get concerned about native plants, but we're poisoning our world. The water that they spray with this garland pour is going right into the intercoastal waterway. It's a hormone. It makes the trees go into bloom really rapidly and then die because they've exhausted themselves. And what's happening to us? The exact same thing. If we're not more cautious of what's happening in our world, 
we're on, on the downslide now. I don't know anybody that's totally healthy right now. And I know young people, and they're not totally healthy either. So we've got a problem. I grew up in an era when the only thing kids got was a broken arm or a broken leg. We didn't have brain cancer, you know? My nephew's got brain cancer. We didn't have all this stuff that's happening today. And a lot of it is because of the poisons that we ourselves are putting in the community. So I'm just asking all of you to start becoming aware of, of poisons that are actually being admitted to the community. Like at Winn-Dixie, they had a pond. Well, these ducks always, always were in the pond. But I went by the other day, and the ducks were in the pond. I was like, what's going on? Then I saw that somebody had gone and sprayed around the pond. And the poor ducks had lost their homes, their livelihood, everything. That's where they lived. That's what they ate. They ate the fish that are now dead. You know, they ate the baby frogs that are now dead. We just can't keep doing this. It's a universal thing, and it's really big in America, and I think it's one of the things we have to take a step back. And as far as the non-native plants, that is climate change. More than it's non-native plants. When I first moved here 30 years ago, there was no Brazilian peppers beyond Umberton, and now you can find them all the way up to Brooksville. That's climate change. So I think my three minutes is probably close to being up, but I just want to express my concerns. And Ma'am, Gail, uh, I have, uh, Tina, when is the uh, Board of County Commissioners meeting? When's the next one? OK. You might want to also go to that meeting, too, ma'am, Gail. OK. All right. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Thank you all. Okay. Have a good day. Tina, I believe you have an email you'd like to read. Yes, Madam Chair, I'd like to um, read an email that was received by Park Chapman into the record for today's citizens to be heard. His email states, after working with the NHTSA accident statistics for years and reading the story in the Tampa Bay Times Friday, July 1st, about the dramatic increase in these tragedies, it seems the slogan, wear white at night or carry a light, has been forgotten. It's fashionable now to wear black clothing, which only exacerbates the problem. Has Forward Pinellas thought about promoting that slogan? And that's the end of the statement. Thank you. Thank you, Tina. With that, we'll move on to recognitions, and I'm going to hand it over to Whit. All right, thank you, Madam Chair. I uh, am very pleased to announce that we are almost at a full complement of staff again at Ford Pinellas. We've, uh, we've endured some losses of good people over the last several months, but we are really excited to have those folks replaced with equally good people that we're uh, pleased to welcome aboard. So I'd like to just acknowledge our new staff members here today. Uh, first, I'd like to introduce Ariane Martins. Ariane, if you could just stand up and wave. Ariane joins us from Texas A&M University. Um, she told me on the walk over here that she has visited Florida a few times, but she has never lived here. So good timing for hurricane season. Um, but we welcome Ariane. She is going to be working on the long range transportation plan that we're just beginning this fall and will be assisting Chelsea uh, in a lot of things related to the MPO. She is an MPO funded position. Uh, and your uh, packet has a little more background than I'm going to cover here uh, for time purposes. Uh, next, I'd like to welcome Dana Santos as our communications and outreach specialist. Dana. Uh, Dana is a Safety Harbor resident, and um, so um, she and I will be getting together more frequently because she's in my neck of the woods, I think. But she reports to me, and she will be handling all of our outreach and communications in conjunction with the rest of our staff, particularly as we embark on the long-range transportation plan, which, uh, as you are aware, uh, has a significant community outreach and engagement um, uh, function. Uh, and Dana comes to us. Uh, she previously worked for the University of Pennsylvania uh, in their medical uh, group, uh, facilitating focus groups and a lot of stakeholder engagement. And I think that'll lend itself to a lot of the work that we do. Next, I'd like to welcome Chris Smith. Chris, if you could wave over here. Chris is uh, an accounting services coordinator who joins us um, from Pinellas County Utilities. She's been a longtime Pinellas County employee. Uh, she's been with the clerk's office and with Parks and Conservation Services as well. And she will be assisting with grants management and helping us with all of our compliance 
at the federal and state level um, for the grants that we receive. And then finally, I would like to introduce our uh, newest uh, member of the uh, USF student uh, group, uh, Caitlin uh, Neiman. She is an um, uh, urban and regional planning graduate student at USF uh, in Tampa. And we've had this program for a few years now, and we've gotten great interns, and we welcome Caitlin. Uh, she and uh, Ariane uh, are both going to help with a lot of the data and analysis and long-range planning work that you see here. So uh, welcome to our staff. <clears throat> and the rest of our staff are super happy, too, because their workload just went down a little bit. Ready to go next? Yes, yes. Okay, so next we'd like to acknowledge um, outgoing member uh, Karen Seal uh, from her uh, long tenure on this board and in service to Pinellas County. And Karen, if you'll join us up there, we're going to move up there for a sec. All right, can you hear me? Good, okay. Well, I just wanted to um, acknowledge that you've been such a great asset to Pinellas County and the region uh, in your work for the MPO over all these years, 20 plus years of service, and um, it, we're gonna miss you. Uh, you've, you've really left your imprint on this county. All you have to do is look at US 19 as a good example, but our trail system, um, so many other things, uh, the gateway area, so many other things have come together because of your leadership over the years. And I'm personally very thankful. Before I say anything more, I'd like to turn it over to Mary. So if you Google Karen, there's not enough pages in Google. So that's how many years, over two decades, uh, she was first appointed out, she was a city commissioner in Clearwater. She was appointed by Jeb Bush. Is that cool? Okay. And um, she is a worth of information. Uh, I don't know how many times I have been on this board and she pulls out a paper that nobody has. I'm talking about the county administrators and she says, I have this paper from, you know, 2004. And uh, it is, but that's one of the things that really resonates with me is she can always bring facts and information that some of us don't have. So I will miss her very, very much. I'm going to give each of you a minute or two to say something, too, after. But before we do that, I want you to see what Ford Pinellas got you, because there really isn't anything that we could give you that's, but we hope you'll like this. We put together, we put together this little tribute. Um, don't look at the Bayside Bridge not being there. This is from a long time ago, before you began serving on the County Commission. But we thought that it captured uh, all that you've done for Pinellas County. We like that US 19 is featured prominently on this map. So we hope you'll find a good place to hang it. <laughs> also, I just want to um, add one more thing that we have been working with the city of Dunedin to get a plaque in your name on one of the benches on the linear park at Edgewater Drive because I know that you like walking that park. So there'll be a permanent reminder that you were once a county commissioner who did a lot of good things for transportation. Oh, <laughs> thank you. Well, um, I don't know how you know, but I collect vintage Florida stuff. And so this is like very appropriate. Uh, it will be treasured because um, I, that's what I love. I, always, I was actually just talking with our staff about our new website for Pinellas County and they were talking about that they had created a map similar to this and I'm like that's what you need to like put prominently everywhere and I told anyway so um I the only thing I can say is I'm just very very grateful I know what it's like to be an elected official and walk in your shoes and the service that you do for our citizens is done with passion, it's done with um, great knowledge, it's done with compassion, it's done with kindness, and it's done really genuinely caring that you're gonna make a difference for the future. So it's all of us collectively together that makes the changes and creates the positive synergy for our citizens. And I, that's all I can say, It's just thank you. I mean, thank you for your service and thank you for your caring deliberations and 
um, the stamp that you're going to leave, the seal of approval <laughs> for uh, future generations and for your children and grandchildren or nephews or nieces or friends, you know, whomever's lives that you've touched. It's just really, it's, it's very, very special. So thank you. I'd like for all of our the uh, elected officials to come up here and silver Karen because I would like to have a picture for of all of you with her. I think that she would like that, and I know that I think we would too. So come on up here for just a second. Going to see where we're going. And as everybody's getting back to their desks, I have another little announcement I'd like to make. Earlier this year, we submitted uh, Commissioner Seal's name uh, to the Association of MPOs for the award of Outstanding of Elected Official Leadership. And I was notified a couple of weeks ago that she was selected. So, and nationally. Yeah, well, she's heard, I've already told her. Um, but uh, that's a really prestigious award from AMPO, which is the National Umbrella Organization of MPOs. And um, it recognizes her 20 years of MPO leadership. And I got an email from AMPO, and the first part of the email was like, oh, the competition was really tough, and a lot of people. And I was thinking, oh, well, this is the no rejection letter. But then it got down, it was like, you really stood out. Your accomplishment stood out. It was a lot of good competition. But uh, they are going to acknowledge you at the October 27th uh, luncheon uh, in Minneapolis. So um, we hope you can be there, but if not, Chelsea will be there from our staff to accept the award. So. Um, I remember going to uh, lobby the, and, and work with the AMPO up in DC. I was actually through my notes and going through my files, I found a record of that visit and it, um, all the people that attended it. And it was when we were trying to lobby for f more monies for highway projects for uh, Pinellas County. So I, it's just, it's been very interesting going through all the files and all the memories and seeing some accomplishments, but then also seeing some things that I, you know, disappointments that, you know, you don't get accomplished. So it's, it's sometimes, you know, it's, it's a mixed bag, but my office looks like a bomb went off. <laughs> <laughs> and then what I'm trying to do is either put some stuff in official records, but mostly I'm trying to meet with department directors, which is now that's the part that's going to be the hardest because I'm saying goodbye to, you know, very special people who genuinely care about making a difference and um, just like you do and work hard every day. And um, so, um, but all is good. I'm grateful um, again for each and every one of you and thank you sincerely most sincerely. Thank you. And I love the... <laughs> one, of my, one of the things I did want to get accomplished, and I think Julie knows about that, is um, I'm so happy to have my name on that bench, and yes, I do genu genu usually walk it every Monday, um, and um, that'll be nice, to, but I've always wanted to make sure we got a grade separated trail there. <laughs> so I'll leave that as one of my legacy projects that still needs to be done because the bikers and the walkers and the rollerbladers and the skaters, it, it's too scary being there sometimes. I'm always looking behind me, waiting for the bike to, yeah. to overtake me. So one of my list of things to do. <laughs> Thank you, Karen. I'm gonna, I'm gonna start with, uh, Mary Rajowski, do you want to say something? 
Uh, yeah, and especially about that project because, uh, hey, Wit, that's the Alt 19 plan that is going to be in limbo forever. <laughs> Um, but it is supposed to be a much wider sidewalk, number one, and have some type of a bike lane. So um, there you heard it from an award winner. <laughs> Let's see how we can get that on the list. Um, anyway, the, the thing about uh, Karen that always impresses me most is um, her honesty. You know, she doesn't look at, oh, I like you, so I'm going to be nice to you, or I'm going to agree with you. I mean, she looks at what's best for the community, and, um, you know, we'll keep the good fight on US-19 for you. Um, but she's always just been there for whenever we've needed to chat about anything, at least in our city, and I'm sure it's the same for others. Um, and I will definitely pass on uh, the well regards uh, to my Dunedin City Commission, who I know just absolutely loves her. She's got some really good friends on my commission. Um, we love you and we hope you enjoy your retirement. Thank you for all your service. Commissioner Seal, you have led by example in so many ways for so many years, not just on Forward Pinellas, but in everything that you have touched over your time of service and you've shown us what it really means to love our county enough to make tough decisions when, the, when that needs to be done and to push forward good ideas when those need to be supported. Um, you've been one of the more positive people that I've seen you know, in elected office, uh, especially during uh, the troubling times and that is quite inspiring. So um, it has been an honor to just be able to watch you lead and watch you serve Pinellas County. We are a better county because of what you have done. And I will always be grateful for that. Thank you. Commissioner Steele, you have been one, it's hard, I'm an introvert, so talking's kind of a, something I get nervous with. So when I first got elected to office and saw your leadership on the county commission, it impressed me. Um, and when I reached out to you about items that came up for my city, I was knowing I could always talk to you and you would be honest with me about ways we could improve our city or the, even the county. Um, what I've loved over the many years that we've served together is that I don't just look at you as a colleague, I look at you as a friend. I've been able to look past things we disagreed on or, and, things, and then the things that we, we've agreed on. And, and serving here with you and seeing your leadership um, makes me a better commis uh, commissioner in my city. And I really appreciate the times that you've taken the time to reach out to me and listen to my concerns and um, help me through my path as a commissioner. And I. Uh, I'm proud to be able to call you as a friend. So thank you for your service in, in, continue, in your retirement. Thank you so much. Yeah, what he said. No, that, <laughs> that was really good. Um, yeah, I, I think um, when I think of Karen, I think of just obviously a good friend, but also just the kindness that she shows really to everybody. Um, when I first got in the elected office in Dunedin, uh, made contact and you know was on the NPO then, um, and she was always there just to make sure, you know, if I needed, have had a question or wanted to get perspective, she was, she was always there. Um, I know when I, when I had my heart attack, really when I just got on the commission, you know, the one I got most calls from and just checking in, just text or whatever, um, just always has that, that, that sense of kindness about her. And clearly on the, as, as an MPO member, you know, as I said, we, on regional issues and everything else, it became a mentor of mine. Uh, and I really, when I got on the county, I wanted to make sure that I was able to stay on the MPO, um, work on the 19 stuff, work on the TMA, because there's a lot of work that needs to be done there. And uh, so just really wanted to say thank you for that. She is a library of knowledge. I mean, every, every document that you might need, uh, but she's so much more than that. Um, I just really want to thank you for my friend for making Pinellas County even better than it already is. Um, and you 
touched so many parts of it. So thank you and best wishes in that next phase. Thank you. So Karen, uh, you and Ron have been friends a long time with uh, Mary Hill and I. And, you know, I was just thinking, uh, 25 years ago, you got me into public service. Uh, and I think it was 97, you appointed me to the Code Enforcement Board with the city. And um, I've been uh, doing something ever since. And I really owe you for that because you've been um, a great leader, somebody to look up to, to see how um, you give yourself to the community. And, you know, you're kind of like my family. I mean, you, you come from a line of people serving the community. Your dad was involved, you know, as being a commissioner, and uh, he designed City Hall, which unfortunately we're going to have to demo soon. But, uh, you know, you just really made an impression in the community in Clearwater, and then you moved on to do the entire county. And as you're hearing tonight, you know, you have done something that's touched everybody. So uh, thank you for that. And great luck in your uh, next endeavor. Um, so we haven't really known each other for very long. We've only interacted on this. But I can say one thing, and Commissioner Eggers touched on it, is that just in my short time here, the one thing that shined through the most about you is your kindness. Um, and I think that's really important um, for people in public service and uh, not as common as you would hope for it to be. That's what I've learned so far. So um, uh, I really appreciate that. And uh, I wish you the best of luck going forward um, with retirement. That sounds nice. I can't wait till I get there either. But <laughs> like most of us here. Yeah, I know. But I've got a ways to go. Yeah. So uh, anyway, good luck. And, and um, thank you for setting a good example. Karen, thank you. Um, over the years, I've, I've, I've watched you. Um, I, I always appreciate not only the compassion, but your consistency over that time period. Um, you don't seem to waver depending upon what the flavor of the month is. You stick with things, and I always very much respect that. And uh, I try to, you know, and, and it's hard to do. I can appreciate that. So. Um, Thank you for your public service. Thank you for your time. And I, as well, um, wish you all the best in, in your future endeavors. I'm sure they'll be very productive and enjoyable. Karen, you know, I always think back to when we first kind of got to know each other was when you were so generous to collaborate with me back in 2019 when you were chair of the county commission on a roundtable discussion about affordable housing an issue of shared interest for our community, but also one that not a lot of people were putting much emphasis on at that particular time. And um, you could have said no, but you didn't. You were open, you were welcoming, you um, really wanted to help me understand the historical aspects of the issue and how the county and the city can work best together. And I've always appreciated you for that. You're so kind, you're so just gracious, and you really lead, especially for women leaders, in a way that I think you're, you're so strong, but you don't come off aggressive, and that I think is critically important um, in how we carry ourselves to our community. You're such a servant leader and um, steadfast. I mean, when, when you believe in something, you see it through. And I know you didn't get it all done, but you got a whole heck of a lot done. And I will never go through a roundabout without thinking of Karen Seal. <laughs> thank you, and thank you for all you do. Congratulations. That was good. Um, we haven't got to know each other, but coming in as a new person here, she, I'll lean over and I'll be like, what are they talking about? And she's like, it's OK. So you made me feel very welcome. My mom was one of your biggest fans. And um, so, you know, and working with her and her always talking and, you know, you, I know, she, you know, the, I guess the word people like to say, she was spicy. So she very much enjoyed the, your company. And she said she always had a friend. So I appreciate that. So thank you. I just want to say thank you very much. I mean, since I've been on the board that, um, 
You know, there's a lot of different um, opinions and, you know, different things said around the board, but you're somebody I always listen to because you give a very thoughtful, articulate um, reasoning behind an issue, you know, whether people agree with you or not, you know, it's, it's something that people can think about and say, well, it was well thought out and it just you know, wasn't something that I pulled from the sky, you know, so I, I have appreciated that very much since I've been on the board and I've certainly learned things and retirement will be great. As speaking as a retired person, you will be busier than you were, <laughs> but now you can pick and choose. <laughs> so thanks so much. Okay. We're gonna move on to the consent agenda. Is there anyone on the board who'd like just, to remove? Before you go. Yes. Just thank you. I want to, I mean, I thank you for the lovely, kind comments. It's very meaningful to me. Thank you. Perfect. We'll move on to the consent agenda. Is there anyone who has, uh, would like to remove an item on the agenda at this time? Move approval. Second. There you go. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Public hearing items. Uh, we are on 6A. Chelsea, hello. Hello. Thank you for being with us. Thank you for having me in person today. I'd like All to right. present. There we go. I'm going to be speaking. Oh. I'll be loud enough. Don't worry, Keith. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to be presenting today on the public participation plan. Um, so this is just a little outline about the different items we're going to cover. It looks like a lot, but it's a fairly short presentation, and you all know I talk fast. Um, so we're going to start with what is the public participation plan. This is really our guide for public outreach as an agency. It helps us gauge the effectiveness and inclusiveness of the outreach that we undertake. And it helps us identify how, do we're going to, how we're going to incorporate public input into our plans, and it really directs broadly our public participation activities. I will note that for every project we undertake as an agency, we have a very unique tailored approach to public outreach because every project is very different. But this plan really just kind of sets the framework for kind of the minimum that we're going to do and gives us some suggestions um, as to how we can do our jobs even better going forward. So why we need it? Well, one of the reasons that we need it is it is a requirement for the Metropolitan Planning Organization or the transportation side of our agency. As an MPO, we are required to have the public participation plan to guide our outreach and to make sure that we are being accountable and that we're doing what we say we're going to do. But in addition to that, and more importantly, it's our responsibility as an agency. We are a publicly funded government agency, and we really need to document that we're not just coming up with these plans and programs sitting in our offices you know, across Court Street. We're actually engaging the public, and we're doing you know, what we should be doing as, a, as an agency. In terms of the components of the plan, there are five different parts and then an appendices. The plan covers who we are and what we do. Um, we outline a lot of the different opportunities for public participation for the agency. Uh, we include a communications roadmap, and I'm going to cover that for you in just a, minute, uh, just a few minutes. We also identify some success stories that we believe that we've had, especially in the last couple of years as we've kind of shifted in the pandemic world to doing virtual engagement and even outdoor engagement. Uh, and then our last part is where we have key performance indicators, where we monitor uh, the outreach that we're doing to make sure that what we're doing is effective and we're not just checking a box. So in terms of what is changing, Organizationally, the document is definitely changing. Um, if you've ever looked at our last public participation plan, it included photos of myself uh, 13 years ago when I was pregnant with my first child. It was time. Um, and we've also developed this roadmap that I'm going to talk about, and then these key performance indicators. We've always had some performance measures that we tried to target uh, as an agency through our public outreach, but we found that they weren't really that effective, and we weren't doing a great job at monitoring them going forward. So we've over overhauled that this time. Uh, also, last year, this agency finalized the equity assessment where we really looked internally to our own plans and programs to ensure that we're being equitable uh, through all of our activities. So this plan really uh, incorporates the equity action plan and the recommendations that came out of that plan. And this is really the biggest difference right here is these employing audience-sensitive tools. And what we did, and this is where that communications roadmap comes in, 
is we looked at who, who might our different audiences be. And we did a pretty comprehensive analysis on what are the best ways to reach those audience, knowing that one size does not fit all. Um, so we really had to be unique in how we tailored our outreach approach. A couple of those examples are you know, our senior citizen population. Some of our seniors may have limited transportation. Some may even have a learning curve with new technology. And through our research, we've determined a lot of our older uh, population uh, isn't really that familiar with, say, Instagram. So we probably don't want to use Instagram as the primary means of outreach when we're targeting these populations. But maybe it's Facebook. Maybe it's you know, flyers, local media, and community meetings. So these are just some examples on how we can um, make these tools available to our planners to target our engagement a little bit better. So in terms of next steps, uh, today we are asking that you um, take action to open the public comment period. Uh, we require upon ourselves to keep our public comment period on this document open for 45 days. We'll be posting this online, getting the word out that this is going to be our strategy for public outreach moving forward, and allow the public the 45 days to comment. After the 45-day period is over, we'll bring this back to you for final adoption in about two months, probably at your November board meeting. And with that, I'm happy to take any questions. Any questions for Chelsea from the board? Okay. Hearing none, Tina, is there anyone in the audience who'd like to? Not on this item, Madam Chair. Thank you. Mayor, uh, I would just like to clarify for the board that uh, this is more of an umbrella framework document that will guide um, more targeted and specialized um, public engagement on specific projects, such as a corridor study or an area plan or our long range transportation plan but we will be consistent with this. So it provides that umbrella framework, if that helps. So we need a motion and a second on this agenda item. All in favor? Aye. That was uh, Brandy. Did you get both? I didn't get the second. Thank you. Uh, with that, we will move to the uh, Pinellas Planning Council. I will first ask Ford Pinellas staff to present the item. The applicant, local government are available for questions as needed. Once each presentation is given, we will ask for the proponents of the proposal to speak, then the opponents, and finally, any other citizen who wishes to comment. We will then hear rebuttal from the applicant as necessary and a staff reason, response, or summary. At that time, the board will ask questions and then I will close the public hearing and the board will deliberate and take action. Our first case is CW22-18 and Nusheen will be presenting. Thank you, Mayor Kennedy. And for the record, Nusheen Rahman, planner with Board Pinellas. And in this case, Pinellas County is seeking to amend a parcel from residential medium to residential high. And the purpose of this is to allow the construction of additional multifamily dwelling units um, in an existing apartment complex. The subject property is located at 6464 54th Avenue North. Specifically, this is in the West Lelman neighborhood in unincorporated Pinellas County and it is approximately 4.3 acres in size. As mentioned, there is a multifamily apartment complex currently on the property and surrounding uses include um, other multifamily residences, single family residences, retail commercial, as well as a public educational facility directly adjacent to the property. The following is an image of the front of the subject property. Next, an image of the east of the subject property. This is actually the educational facility and I'll talk to you a little bit more about that. And lastly, an image of the south of the subject property. The map in front of you shows the current countywide plain map category of residential medium. And as mentioned, because the intent is to develop uh, additional multifamily dwelling units, the current um, density and intensity standards of this category um, do not allow for the number of units that the applicant is proposing, hence the proposed amendment to residential high, which would allow that within its threshold. And that's shown to you on uh, the map here, along with the permitted uses and density and intensity standards of this category. Now, as mentioned, um, this amendment area is located adjacent to a school, specifically Blanton Elementary School. And um, we contacted um, the 
Pinellas County School Board representative who was on our planner's advisory committee um, regarding this amendment because it is actually um, one of the countywide considerations um, to look at amendments which might increase a density next to a public educational facility because the idea is that that could uh, contribute to the capacity at the school. Um, but after talking to the representative, um, it was stated that Blayton Elementary currently has sufficient capacity for its enrolled population, as well as additional unused capacity. Um, and based on that, this proposed amendment is unlikely to strain the capacity of the school um, if more school-age children were to be added as a result of the additional units. So to conclude, this proposed amendment is appropriate for its intended purpose and is consistent with the locational characteristics for the residential high category, and it can be concluded that this is consistent with the relevant countywide considerations contained in section 6531 of the countywide rules. And in front of you are those usual considerations. And lastly, there were no public comments received for this case. Thank you. Thank you, Mushin. Tina, are there any proponents, opponents, or citizens to be heard? Madam Chair, Mr. Todd Pressman would like to address the board. He's a proponent. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, board members, Todd Pressman, 200 Second Avenue South, number 451 in St. Petersburg. Um, this request has received all approvals from the Pinellas County staff to the wisdom of the Board of County Commissioners, uh, Planners Advisory Board, and your staff. Um, the request targets workforce housing and would allow approximately 25 to 30 additional units at a very successful multifamily development now. And uh, as your staff has presented to you, we've received uh, not a single uh, word or person in opposition to the request. Um, so as before you, uh, we ask for your consideration and uh, approval today. Thank you very much. Happy to answer questions you might have. Thank you, Todd. Does anyone have any questions at this time? Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else, Tina? No, Madam Chair. We'll close the public hearing. And uh, I will in I'm inquiring if any of the board members have any questions at this time. Hearing none, I need a motion. Move to approve. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion carries, thank you. Again, Nasheen will be presenting, this is case CD, CW 2219. Thank you, Nasheen. Thank you, Mayor Kennedy. This is also submitted by Pinellas County, um, this time in the Crystal Beach neighborhood of Unincorporated County, um, seeking to amend a property from residential low medium to office. And the purpose of this amendment is to essentially render the amendment area consistent with um, the larger property that is outside of this amendment area that is also designated office. The property is located at 3205 um, Alt-19 and is approximately 0 0.13 acres in size. Currently it's vacant and utilized as a parking lot, likely for the larger subject property um, that it is seeking to become consistent with. And surrounding uses include single family residential and other office uses. So follow, the following is an image of the front of the subject property showing that use as a parking lot. Next an image of the east of the subject property, um, examples of the office uses that I mentioned. And lastly, images of the north of the sub north of the subject property. The map here shows the current countywide plan map category of residential low medium. So it is seeking to become consistent with the area directly to the east that's in pink, that's also designated office, hence the proposed amendment. And here you can see on this map um, that that uh, one parcel becomes consistent under the office designation. To so conclude, this amendment is appropriate for the intended purpose and is consistent with the locational characteristics of the office category, and it, it can be concluded that this amendment is consistent with the countywide considerations in section 6531 of the countywide rules, shown here in front of you. And there were also no public comments for this case concluding this presentation. Thank you, Nasheen. Tina, are there any proponents, opponents, or citizens to be heard? No, Madam Chair, there is not. Thank you, and we will close the public hearing. Are there any questions from the board at this time? Hearing none, I'll, I'll be moved to approval from Commissioner Edgars. Oh, question, okay. I noticed that you know, when you looked at the map there, that the depth of the properties, uh, this is gonna go back, so it's similar to the properties to the north and the south of it. 
uh, as far as the zoning changes that you're asking for here. Do you see it going, uh, any, any further intrusion into the residential neighborhood or do you think this will probably be the last piece? I would say based on this amendment, the goal was just to bring consistency with the entirety of the parcel. Um, it's, it's an assumption, but it yeah. can be said that that's where it's gonna stop. It's all residential behind it. Uh, Correct. Okay. Correct, thank you. So I move yes. to Bruce case number CW 22-19. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. One more, uh, Nusheen, this is case CW2220. Please pre present. Thank you. This one is from the city of Clearwater, in this case seeking to amend a property from the office category to the public semi-public category. And the purpose of this amendment is to allow for the development of a facility for social, uh, public, or educational purposes, uh, better known as a YMCA. <laughs> Um, the subject property is located at 905 South Highland Avenue and is approximately 1.86 acres, um, acres in size. Currently it is vacant, but it was um, the site of a former nursing home which was demolished in 2006. And surrounding uses include institutional, single family residential, and office uses. So this image here shows the front of that vacant subject property. Next, south of the subject property. So this property is the current YMCA that has been uh, bought out by another property owner, and the idea is that the smaller property would be the home of the new YMCA. And next, we have an image of the west of the subject property. The map here shows the current countywide plan map category of office, um, and as mentioned, um, because the goal is to create a sort of social public uh, facility, a better suited category is the public semi-public category, shown here in front of you, and you can see that this amendment really just brings this whole area into consistency. To conclude, this proposed amendment is appropriate for the intended purpose and is consistent with the locational characteristics of the public semi-public category, and it can be concluded that this amendment is consistent with the relevant countywide considerations contained in section 6531 of the countywide rules, and here they are in front of you again. And there were also no public comments for this case, concluding this presentation. Thank you, Nasheen. You know, are there any proponents, opponents, or citizens wishing to be heard? No, Madam Chair, there is not. Any board members have any comments at this time? Yes. Dave. <laughs> um, I'm really excited about this because uh, yes. it was sad to lose the Y, the Suncoast YMCA right. there on Highland. It was our first rec center in Clearwater, basically. Um, so downsizing, they, they just had too big of a facility with all the other ones. So this is good. It's near the same location and uh, people know where it is. So. Me too, I, I'm glad to. Uh, anyone else? Hearing none, I'm looking for a motion. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries, thank you. Mayor Kennedy, I'm sorry, who was the second? Mike? Oh. No. Okay, it was David Aldwin. Thank you. Uh, we will now move on to presentations and or action items. That would be 7A. We'll start with PSTA. Council Member Driscoll, would you, do you have your report today? I do. Good. Thank you. The PSTA board met last on August 24, 2022. Here are some of the highlights. We honored the State of Florida Technician of the Year <clears throat> right here at home, um, selected by the Florida Public Tr Transportation Association. The recipient is PSTA's ASCE Master Transit Bus Technician, Paul Levesque. So we had an opportunity to recognize and celebrate his award. <clears throat> an update on the Sunrunner as we prepare for that launch on October 21st, 2022. PSTA will also be making adjustments to um, Route 18 and the Central Avenue trolley to complement the Sunrunner increase in overall service. Regarding PSTA's community bus plan, um, we'll begin a new plan that will provide the technical basis for the development of capital and operating priorities in the 10-year transit development plan. We'll be procuring a consultant to assist with this. There will be significant public engagement um, involved as um, that includes an onboard survey for our riders. 
The consultant will um, evaluate potential funding scenarios and work with community residents and partner agencies to determine our priorities. And the effort and results of this will also be in line with the Ford Pinellas Long Range Transportation Plan and form the basis of the transit element of that plan. Our next meeting will be held on September 28, 2022 at 6 p.m., uh, which is the final approval of our FY23 budget. And um, prior to that, though, there will be simply an FY23 military public hearing, um, which is actually tonight at 6 p.m. Um, that does it for my report on PSTA. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. We're going to move now. We're going to skip 7B and we're going to move on to 7C. Yes. I just want to make one comment about the PSTA. Then maybe it was overlooked, maybe it was said last time, but we did get the $20 million grant from the federal yes. government for our intermodal center. And I want to thank Ford Pinellas for supporting that and the hundreds of people that put in their letters. Thank you, thank you, thank you. This was. Um, I think a big win for Clearwater and the, and the region. So thank you very much. I want to thank the city of Clearwater City Council for supporting that uh, grant application and the action you took. Thank yeah. you very much. And I also just want to comment that um, Council Member Albritton was quite the leader in making sure that this went through and went through smoothly. So thank you very much. 7C Urban Design Service Pilot Program, Nusheen. Shouldn't have sat down, should I? No. <laughs> <laughs> so in a rare occasion, I'm presenting something to you that is not a land use case. And today I'm bringing forward to you two project recommendations for our Urban Design Services Pilot Program. Now this program was one that you had the opportunity to approve in our March meeting, but at the time it existed under the consent agenda. So this is really my first opportunity to explain to you a little bit more about the program and the details of the project recommendations that we have for you so far. So to recap, this program is a partnership between us at Ford Pinellas and Pinellas County's Department of Housing and Community Development with $100,000 available in funding, 25 grand of which has been contributed by Pinellas County. And for this program, we've also selected the consulting firm SNME to help us administer um, this work. And the purpose of this program is to improve the quality of new development, or really redevelopment, as we're all keenly aware that we're largely a redeveloping community, using various urban design tools with city staff, developer, and stakeholder engagement at the core of the project management process. So, after we hired SNME as our consultants, uh, we put out a call for projects to our various local governments where they had the opportunity to submit letters of interest um, for project proposals that could function under three project components or what we're calling task work orders. The first are projects that work with developers to provide urban design guidance during the site or development plan process early on. And the second are projects that work with community or neighborhood groups to host charrettes or design studios. If any of you are not familiar with what a charrette is, I think the quickest way to describe it would be that it's a really hands-on, involved, focus group type of workshop. Um, and lastly, the third component is um, our projects that evaluate or advise on proposed form-based codes or other types of land use regulations. Now, the idea was that a local government could submit a letter of interest that involved one or more of these components. But something that we really expressed to our local governments, and I'm sure you'll all agree that a good project man management practice is to utilize your funds effectively. And we recognize that $100,000 spread across multiple projects can feel limiting. So something that we really wanted to get out of these projects was the idea of transferability of the design recommendations that come out of each project so that these um, recommendations can serve as a basis for inspiration or best practice for redevelopment around the county. And so with that, I will be presenting to you two of the projects that we're moving forward with, recommend, with recommending based on the letter, letters of interest that we've received. And the first is from um, the city of Clearwater, who are in the process of establishing a CRA or community redevelopment area for their North Greenwood neighborhood. 
Now, the North Greenwood CRA would uh, be a higher level plan and have um, higher and address higher level issues for the community. But what the city has proposed to do uh, is utilize these project funds to visualize change and, and get design recommendations specifically for the MLK Avenue corridor, which is identified as the historic heart of the community. And it's a need of redevelopment and increased pedestrian activity as identified by the city. And so in working with the consultants at SNME, um, this project is anticipated to have three different phases. The first is to conduct stakeholder interviews and um, conduct a site tour with city staff. As part of the North Greenwood CRA efforts, there already is an existing steering committee sort of leading those efforts. So we would like to involve them in this process because at the end of the day, this is the work that they've already put in to this neighborhood. The second phase of this project will be to host a multi-day charrette. We're looking at about like a two-day charrette to visualize change with community and stakeholder involvement. And the layman's way of saying that is basically we just want to sit down with the community and talk to them about what they want, what they need, and what they visualize as coming out of the redevelopment of MLK Avenue. And lastly, the third phase of this project will be to propose code amendments and form-based regulations for the MLK Avenue corridor. And while this project will only focus on MLK Avenue, again, the idea of transferability of this project is that these design recommendations can help with the remainder of the neighborhood, but also on a larger picture, provide an example of establishing design standards for a newly um, designed or newly established CRA for our other local governments as well. So we expect this project timeline to be approximately three months, um, but in great news, the city of Clearwater has also expressed their commitment to um, provide $25,000 of their own local funds for this project to help meet these fee estimates. And so the project fees, um, and to clarify, these project fees were estimated by our consultants at SNME, whose work we will uh, be helping manage um, but these fees are expected not to exceed $59,480, and that's to be met utilizing that local match of $25,000. So that wraps up the first project recommendation. And the second one is for our partners at Pinellas County, who have proposed to utilize this pilot program for sort of on-call assistance um, for site or design plan um, guidance for proposed developments. And basically in this case, what's going to happen is that the county will come to us um, regarding project proposals or development proposals that they receive um, that they believe could benefit from design guidance in achieving compatibility with the surrounding neighborhood. Because as we're all aware, unincorporated county has very unique and varying um, enclaves and neighborhoods throughout the county. But something that the county has also identified to us or some priorities that they've identified to us are potentially developments that improve um, or shape the public pedestrian realm, Desi um, developments that improve design aesthetics for affordable housing developments in order to make them more compatible with the existing neighborhood, and also developments or site plans um, that are in downtown Palm Harbor. Because as you're all aware, downtown Palm Harbor uh, not too long ago adopted its own form-based code. And this project timeline is a little bit more flexible because of the sort of on-call or as-needed nature um, that Pinellas County will be utilizing these funds in. Um, so the idea is that these funds are going to be used until expended or until the end of fiscal year 2023, and that is in an amount of $25,000 that is not to be exceeded, that they can identify um, to us when they want to use based on project or development priorities. So today, what I'm asking from you um, is uh, to move to approve uh, project one, which I'll refer to for clarity as uh, the project for Clearwater and project two from Pinellas County um, Housing and Community Development in the amounts of $59,480 and $25,000 respectively, keeping in mind that um, for Clearwater's fee estimates, that will be met utilizing the local funds that they will provide as well. And before you provide your action, um, I'm happy to take any questions if you have them. Does anyone have any questions for Nusheen? Hearing none, Tina, is there anyone who would like to speak on the Urban Design Service Pilot Program? No, Madam Chair, there's not. So be, we're going to take a motion. We're going to do this twice. Do you want to do two separate, or do you want to do it all at once? Tina, they can do it all at once, right? I think a motion to approve Project 1 and Project 2 would suffice. OK, perfect. Do we have a motion? David? 
Mike, Michael Smith. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Chelsea, back up here to do another presentation. This is on 7D strategic intermodal system cost feasible plan yes. development. Oh. All right, so we're going to talk today about the SIS. Um, so the strategic intermodal system, because we all love acronym, acronyms and planning, is called the SIS. The SIS is really the highest priority for, mo for the mobility of people and goods in the state of Florida. Uh, facilities that are designated as SIS, they're designated as such by the state. And the map that you see up on the screen, those are the facilities that are going to be referenced that are here in Pinellas County. You'll see a little black segment that uh, goes down US 19 and across Gandhi. That is uh, shaded because that is actually scheduled to come off of the strategic inter intermodal system or the SIS. And that's coming off because the Gateway Expressway is going to be replacing that as an SIS facility. So that's why you'll see that a little bit differently um, on the map. And then the airport, uh, the PIE, is, the, uh, is an SIS facility as well uh, in, the, in Pinellas County. Um, so these corridors are really the primary emphasis of FDOT for funding and capacity projects. FDOT prioritizes the projects for these corridors, and then the MPOs include the projects in the long-range plan so that they can advance. As we've talked about, the long-range plan is really that guiding document for our agency, and if a project is not included in the LRTP, it cannot go forward. So really designating the SIS and identifying the projects for it, is, it requires a very strong partnership between us and FDOT. So what is the SIS cost feasible plan? So every five years, uh, the Florida Department of Transportation goes and or designates their cost feasible plan, much like we do through our own long range plan. So they have the first five year plan, which is your, your work program that we bring to you each spring for approval. Then there's a second five-year plan, uh, and that's really year six through 10, and those projects then feed into the work program, so it's kind of like a, a queuing system. And then there's the cost feasible plan, and these are the projects that are reasonably expected to be able to be funded uh, within the next 11 to 25 years, and then they kind of make their way through the process. Uh, and then, of course, there's unfunded needs, projects that the Florida Department of Transportation believes are needed for mobility, but we just don't think we're gonna be able to pay for in the next 25 years. Um, so, in terms of the timeline for developing this cost feasible plan, uh, the district plans are currently under review uh, by each of the FDOT districts. Uh, they're finishing up that review right now. They're going to send their comments up to central office. Central office is going to consider all of the comments received from the different districts throughout the state of Florida and develop one statewide plan in the fall of this year. And then that plan will be finalized over the process of several months. And in May 2023, it'll be sent to the MPOs and it'll be up to us how we incorporate that into the long range transportation plan that we're gonna be developing over the next two and a half years. So I wanna kind of walk through with you, there was a table in your packet, but it was a little bit much. Uh, so I'm really just gonna highlight the projects that touch Pinellas County. The first one is uh, the I-275 corridor. Um, the project you'll see up there, the number one, that's the 275 corridor. The project in the plan is to add express lanes and lane continuity improvements along that corridor. We've been talking about this project for quite a few years. We've included it in the LRTP in the past. We're very supportive of moving it forward into the future. The second project is Gandy Boulevard. This is a section east of 4th Street uh, where there will be adding of lanes and an overpass at Brighton Bay, Derby Lane, and then also the replacement of the Gandy Bridge. The third project is a connection from the Gateway Express to, it's actually the connection is to Roosevelt coming down just west of MLK and 9th Street up in the St. Petersburg area. And then the fourth uh, is really a series of projects along US 19 that includes interchanges at Tampa, Nebraska, Klosterman, and Tarpon. So this is our opportunity to take a look at all the projects that FDOT is proposing and then provide comments back to them on those, on those projects. Also included in your packet is a letter of proposed or recommended staff comments, and I'm going to walk through those comments with you right now, and at the end, we're going to ask for your authorization or approval to authorize Whit Blanton to sign that letter on our behalf. The first is on I-275. Um, in the table, included in your packet, it explains that there are going to be some capacity improvements, but it is not clarified whether those are going to be told or not told. We're under the impression that those are going to be told capacity improvements, so we'd like to just seek some clarification. 
In addition, that corridor was identified as one that is particularly uh, vulnerable to resilience challenges going forward, so we would like to request that the department consider resilience improvements, hardening of the, of the project as it moves forward. The second project is related to Gandhi Boulevard from east of 4th Street. Again, we just want to confirm that any additional capacity in that corridor is going to be a tolled or managed lane, and we'd like to confirm that the replacement of the Gandhi Bridge will include a multi-use path on the side, or somehow integrated into the corridor. Uh, on the third project, uh, the Roosevelt Connector, there were no comments on that project. We had quite a few when it came to US-19. Um, Included in the, in the table was the construction of an interchange along US-19 at Tarpon Avenue. This is a project that is not currently included in our long-range transportation plan. We actually received a request from the city of Tarpon Springs a few years ago to remove that from our long-range plan because they were not supportive of a grade-separated interchange being constructed at that location. Um, so we would be recommending that we would not be including that in our long-range plan going forward unless there is some big change and all of a sudden the community wants to see that project. One thing I will say is that if a project already has some funding attached to it, if the department has already, say, completed an entire design for a project, we can't just take it out of the long-range plan because that would be kind of a waste of resources. But that project in particular at Tarpon, no, no planning, well, planning had been done, but no funds had been expended on right-of-way or design, so we were able to take it out of the plan. The next comment that we had was on US-19 regarding the Tampa and Nebraska interchanges. Uh, you may have noticed on the broader table, including your packet, that that project was a little bit far down on the list. Uh, because we think that it is a very important project, we'd like to see it move forward. We are requesting uh, that FDOT consider elevating the priority of that project a bit higher on the list so that it could be going under construction at the time that the Curlew interchange is completed. Um, the US-19 interchange at Klosterman, an interchange system is described in the table. However, we're still coordinating with FDOT as to what the improvements along US-19 are going to look like when it, uh, when it um, relates to Alderman and Klosterman. We're not totally sold on an interchange at this time because we want to get through that analysis. So we're asking that FDOT kind of broaden the, uh, broaden the description of that project so that there could be alternative, um, alternative treatments considered. And then our final project on US-19, uh, as it relates to Alderman, we did not see that project in the table at all. Uh, the table seemed to skip over that segment, uh, so our comment was related to that and getting a little bit more clarification about what's happening at that intersection. Uh, some other comments that we had that were not directly related to the projects in the table. Uh, there is a pending CIS policy change that will broaden the definition of projects that are eligible for SIS funding. So we would request that going forward, the department incorporate that pending CIS policy change so that more facilities could be considered for funding. The SIS pot of funding is pretty large compared to any of the other funding pots uh, available to us. And so we'd like to have as many projects as possible eligible for that source. And then we also ask for increased coordination with the AMPOs to incorporate safety and multimodal mobility into future SIS projects, and that they not just be focused solely on roadway capacity. So for our next steps, again, we're asking for your approval to authorize the director to transmit these comments, and then we're gonna to continue to work with FDOT on these SIS projects and how we incorporate them into the 2050 long range plan as we start the development on that in the coming months. And with that, I'm happy to take any questions. Any questions? We'll start with Commissioner Edgars. Uh, yeah, just two things. At first, I'm glad to see you're asking about Alderman. I did see that that was missing. And uh, secondly, uh, when we decided to remove the Tarpon Springs overpass, I think that was the real pushback. Mm -hmm. um, I'd just like to at least the, consider the thought of how we improve that intersection without that. Uh, maybe maybe we run out of ideas, but. <laughs> Clearly, McMullen Booth Road, East Lake Road going south is, is, has sold itself to the devil. We have all kinds of lights up and down that road, and I don't see that changing much. Um, there may be some other solutions to help tr move traffic. So the idea would be to get people over to 19, mm -hmm. especially when these improvements start to happen. And that left-hand turn going south in the morning, there's two, la two lanes, really long, but they just don't give enough time and don't give enough room. Same going eastbound, but that's not SIS. That's uh, over on East Lake Road. But I just like the, the idea of perhaps keeping improvements to that intersection short of an overpass at this point. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that makes sense. Um, to clarify, and Chelsea, correct me if I'm wrong, 
what Tarpon really objected to was the overpass not making capacity improvements or mobility improvements. They just really objected to the bifurcation of their community. They were trying to unite mm -hmm. that part of the city from an economic development and connectivity standpoint. And we're certainly open to that as well. And we're starting the new long range plan this fall and it'll have to be adopted by 2024. So I've talked to Chelsea and you know, one of the things I think we really wanna get out of this long range plan is clarity on exactly what we're gonna do north uh, on US 19. And it might be that that interchange goes back in if we can find a way to make Tarpon Springs um, um, welcome that improvement, or if there's an alternative improvement that they would welcome, then we would build that into the plan. And that's all we're asking FDOT is to acknowledge that that planning effort in our minds still hasn't really concluded from what we asked for in 2016. And I will say that um, that intersection or interchange is still in, in our conversations with FDOT. We're looking at all of the interchanges from Tampa Road all the way up to the Pasco County line. So we haven't forgotten about that one completely. Thank you. Thank you, David. Mayor Bajowski, you, you don't want to come up, you're good? Okay. Anyone else who has a question? Ms. Lewis? Um, yeah, Chelsea, I don't know if this is um, specifically for you or perhaps for any um, FDOT personnel in the audience, but as long as you, it's not on the table, but since we're discussing the, the letter, it's referenced in the letter. Um, it's the Howard Franklin Bridge replacement. And there's a couple of meetings ago, we had an individual here, I believe his name was Neil Constantino, and talked a little bit about things that could be done with that center bridge, the existing bridge, which is destined to be removed. And you know, I, I tend to, I, I drive a lot south on, on 275. I, I see the, the, the piece parts of the old Sunshine Skyway bridge, which is there, which is now like 42 years later, it's still functional as a fishing pier, as recreational, some things like that. And I don't know what the committee's thoughts would be, I'd like to just maybe hear a few, but the removal of that, I understand there's a, you know, there's a cost associated with it, but there could be some good uses to keeping it there. Mm -hmm. And I, I frequent the, the, um, uh, the, the bridge between Clearwater and Tampa, and I know there's a nice shared lane there between walking and biking and I know there'll be a walking and biking lane put onto here too. But as Commissioner Seal said earlier today too, there is some niceties about having a place that you can walk and a place that you could ride. Mm -hmm. And it would seem to me that perhaps you could have the center lane for walking, for fishing, for various uses. Maybe the outer lane could be for biking primarily. Could be an eco tourism thing. Could you imagine having a biking Audubon, basically? You know, not having a, a fairly higher speed lane. So, before we, before that idea completely goes away and they start removing it, um, I was just interested in if there's any thoughts about trying to keep some of it or where it is in that process. Mm -hmm. I mean, some could be removed. Not all of it has to be removed, piece parts of it. Mm -hmm. But again, I understand there can be areas of, of scour of, of, you know, it will break down after time. Mm -hmm. But like I said, uh, 42 years of looking at the, the Sunshine Skyway Bridge, and it's useful in some capacity. And, um, and, and I know a lot of people that fish on that bridge and are happy for it. So um, I really don't know where that would fit in, but. I saw it listed in the letter, and we've got long-term plans and thoughts here, and this seems to be a, a good place to put that in. So. Yeah, and I mean, I would have to defer to the department for their, their exact policy, but in the conversations that we have had, uh, Florida Department of Transportation, I believe the Sunshine Skyway may have been the last bridge that they agreed to kind of keep as fishing piers because of the maintenance costs, and they have had this policy position that they will not be paying for the maintenance of that facility if it were to remain. Um, I've been in conversations where they've offered it to the county, saying if the county would like to take it on, then they can transfer it to the county, but the county is also not interested. 
Um, the Gandhi Bridge was an example of one that was saved a few years ago, but the, it didn't last for very long. Before pieces started falling into the ocean, it became a safety hazard. Um, so again, I'd have to defer to the department, and Justin, if you want to chime in here. No, he doesn't want to. Um, <laughs> yeah, but the, the, those are the conversations we've been hearing so far. It's just the maintenance costs are pretty excessive long term, and it just has not been deemed appropriate for the department to spend their funding on maintaining a structure like that at that cost. Even even for just small bits of it, just the, the parts that are attached to the land for people to be able to use it and, and, mm -hmm. uh, and have some enjoyment out of it. So far, that is their policy. But the new facility will hopefully, I believe it's about 12 feet wide, attached to the bridge going over to Tampa. It's going to have four rest areas with shade structures for people that are walking and biking. Um, so it should be a, a pretty nice facility to be able to cross the bay on. Mm -hmm. I do not believe fishing will be allowed, at least not on the bridge structure itself. All right, well, it's a, it's a question. I mean, I drive to the Keys every couple of weeks as well. I see lots of old, old bridges which are there. Some are being repaired, of course, but tons of people fishing, tons of people enjoying life, and uh, an opportunity is there, and I'd hate to, it would cost a fortune to put it in for that particular application. While it's there, um, it's just uh, something I didn't want to let go. Um, if I'm the only one interested in it. <laughs> Understood. Uh, Chelsea, real quick. Uh, you said the county said no. D did they come, is the department had an estimated maintenance repair, you know, kind of ongoing costs for, say, the next 20 years type of thing? Or? I'm not sure if those cost estimates have been developed. Uh, the individual, uh, the private citizen who was involved, developed some cost estimates as well. Um, but as far as I know, the department has said that it's just not financially feasible and they weren't interested. I think he was asking about the county. Did, did county. Neil Cosentino make a presentation to the county as yeah. well? We've been all in joint meetings where the county has been involved and the county hasn't said they're interested in, in stepping forward. They just said conceptually or just there was cost associated? They said, oh, no, that's something. It's the cost because if, if it were transferred to the county, the county would have to take on all those long-term operating costs. And I believe there were some... Some, some calculations that were provided to them on what that would be. Right. And y'all may remember the Gandhi Friendship Trail, which this MPO really helped spearhead the development of that trail. I got to work on that, and uh, we were all very proud of having that Friendship Trail bridge. But when it started to really deteriorate, and FDOT came back and said, this is what we told you would happen, the price tag was, if I remember right, it was like $30 million uh, just to maintain it for a few more years. And uh, both Hillsborough County and Pinellas County at that time said no. So that bridge went away. Mm -hmm. There's a useful life to all these things. I mean, I think you're making a good point about the fishing pier and the Skyway. Um, you know, we'll continue to you know have conversations, but I think we've heard pretty clearly from the department. Useful life I get. I'm sure the bridge has had money put into it recently. There's probably a, uh, a useful life on the bridge right now right. right so I mean if you stopped it right now it'd probably be good for 10 years or 15 years or five years or something like that so there's already been money put in to keep it improved right so uh, but yes I understand there is a point where it will fail but um, well that and I guess that's what I was getting at it's like right. well you know what is a useful life what is that cost at least the, you know just have that knowledge right. that information and Will the money for demolition still be available once that 10 years or 20 years is up and then it has to be demolished and it turns I'm back so to us? I'm so glad you came up. Well, hello there. Hi. Justin Hall with FDOT. Whoa. Put this thing down here a little bit. Um, I don't have the exact numbers, and part of it's because the maintenance every year, the cost is going up. And so just to give you an idea, we've been averaging about every three years we have to do a bridge rehab uh, to try and keep the corrosion at bay from the, the old span um, and to the tune of like 10 to $20 million every two to three years just to keep it. And it, it's going up exponentially every time that we do it. And, and a couple things just to think about, and this is something that we've presented. Uh, one, the environmental analysis assumed that that bridge would not be there. And some people would say, hey, what does that make a difference? But when you look at where we locate spans and water flow, it does make a difference. Um, so that's something that would have to be restudied uh, to see if it could be approved. 
Uh, the other thing too is the contractor already has the equipment on site to demo that bridge. Um, in fact, uh, part of the reason why they're moving as quickly as they are on the new span is to be able to take that bridge down. And the reason why is I'm sure you've heard uh, what happened in Escambia Bay uh, where you know you had a bridge hit the, or a barge hit the bridge, but you also had sea level rise issues. And so what they're really concerned about is that bridge is really low and we're really worried about you know a future uh, storm event also like causing greater damage and actually lifting part of that bridge deck. Uh, so all these things we've we've documented. Uh, there's a Tampa Bay Times news article where we laid out a lot of issues and reasons why, from the DOT perspective, it doesn't make sense. Um, one thing for the fishing pier, you know, we talked about is there won't really be access on that side anymore uh, with the lane shift. So you'd have to come up with a way to provide like an exit for cars to get off the interstate and back on the interstate. Um, so there's a lot of there's a lot of re logistical reasons why, you know. Um, um, We've all said it's a very admirable request, and it was something that we looked, we spent a lot of time looking into uh, when it was first presented to us, and we tried to find any possible use that we could use, and actually that's what led to, to the expansion of the trail connection uh, with the existing Howard Franklin Bridge, because we heard, hey, you know, we need trail access, we want cross access, you know, so th those kind of things were already incorporated in the design to try and capture some of those um, uh, concerns and feedback with keeping the old bridge. And that's why there's also there are the, the four pull-off spots along the trail that you can stop that are shade covered. So we're really trying to check those boxes and provide, you know, a, a facility across the bay uh, that's safe for pedestrians and bicyclists. So. All right. Well, thank you for coming up. That yeah. uh, that that uh, helps answer my question and give me a better feel that uh, ideas are incorporated in new design from that. So. so. And I'm an avid fisherman, so trust yeah, me, if yeah, it, yeah. there's a reason for it to nice stay, thing. I'd be lobbying yeah. for it. I can, tell you, I can tell you that right now. So why no fishing on that side? Why is it just pedestrians and bicycles? Uh, that, you're an avid fisherman, because so am yeah, I. Yeah, yeah, part, part of it, so. I mean, part of it, unfortunately, is just due to the fact that, that people don't do a really good job of cleaning up after themselves. And part of it, too, is uh, you have concerns with trail users, with people casting, you know, uh, having, you know, some dangerous conditions there. So... That's, Let's look that's, at Dunedin Causeway. Yeah, I mean, they, there, there's, there's several examples where uh, it just it, it, it doesn't work very well. Um, and we're very fortunate to have the Skyway Fishing Pier. I mean, we're, mm -hmm. if you look at a lot of other areas, you know, they don't have a facility like that. So we are very fortunate that that fishing pier is still there. So I enjoy going out there. Any other questions? Commissioner Seals? Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, so I, um, this is for 2033 to 2050, so it's really 10 years from now that we're looking at. So is there a timeline that we have to send this letter or give our comments? That's question one. And then question two is, can you request changes later instead of making the, some of the changes now? And then I'll, once I know that, then I'll Chelsea, do you know the timeline? Yeah, it was the last day of August. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, they've extended it for us, so we'd have time to take it to you for comment. Okay. Um, so, but can we, five years from now, if we wanted to make changes to some yes. of these projects, we could still do it, even mm -hmm. 10 years from now? This plan is updated every five years. It right. coincides with our LRTP, so there are always opportunities to make changes. Okay. So, um, my recommendation you know, you have um, new commissioners on the Tarpon Springs Commission who may have, you know, I don't know whether they would agree with taking the center change off or not. Um, people change. So I, I think you should leave some of these alone just in case and just to see where the department goes with suggested changes to the projects because I know we were informally talking about doing different interchanges or different design elements. And because of the monies that are assigned to this and that most of the monies would start in 2033, I hesitate to, you know, 10 years from now to make the decision today when we really don't know what US 19, and that's where I'm going as you probably guess, what we might need five years from now. And so, um, I mean, while I agree with making sure we get aldermen on the list. I'm hesitant to 
take the frontage road away from Klosterman because that funding is 113 million assigned to it. So they're gonna take that money and go put it some other place. I'd rather keep the money in the table and see where, what design elements happen in the meantime. And so that's where I'm kind of going. Um, obviously we do want Tampa and Nebraska to be uh, moved up, but I do hesitate to um, take money away from either the Tarpon Interchange or Klosterman Interchange when there might be different designs that come forward where that 88 million and 113 million will, like I said, be reassigned to somebody else. So I'd rather reserve comment on that at this point if we could. Whit, do you want to comment on that at all? Yeah, I, I'm, and I understand what you're saying, Commissioner. I think that, that makes sense. One of the challenges we have is with the strategic intermodal system, we don't have that much leverage in ensuring that we get the project we want because the SIS is ultimately decided by Tallahassee in consultation with the district and our really only leverage is whether it's in the long range plan or not. And if it's not in the long range plan, they can't really go forward with it. Um, but if it's in the long range plan um, and it's consistent, then it's because it's an SIS facility, it, it really leaves us out of some of the decision making. Now this district staff is different maybe than the previous district staff and we have a great working relationship, but that's our procedural way of making sure we have their attention on the SIS. So with Tarpon, I felt like at the time when we took it out it was 2017 at the request of the city, it's because we had different leadership in District 7 mm -hmm. and we really needed to get their attention and make sure that they fully evaluated the options in that quarter rather than just going and, and planning and designing and building interchanges. And sometimes these projects get a little ahead of us because you know, we see it in the work program and then lo and behold, we're at 60% design plans and we haven't been consulted. And that's happened on a couple of road projects, not on the SIS, but on other projects in our district recently. So, um, But then I would specifically ask that they not remove the funding right. that is in the... So that, that's the that's, intent. That's my biggest concern is you, this letter sounds like a rejection in some cases, so they're going to take that money and go assign it to, some, to Hillsborough County. Well, I Sorry. think <laughs> the intent of our letter, and we can certainly look at the language there, is not to have any money shifted away and not mm -hmm. really move away from these as priorities, but just to make sure that we do our due diligence to fully investigate all the options, because we've heard very clearly from the business community on that part of North 19 that they don't want to see their businesses negatively impacted by whatever's constructed out there. And they, um, and I say they, it's, you know, it's not one uh, single voice, but it was pretty overwhelming when we were at Harbor Hall in Palm Harbor a few years ago that um, they saw what happened to the South with the businesses and the impact, and they fear that. So um, I think if- But they if, may also fear when they start seeing the backup at the traffic lights yeah. Absolutely. And people don't come US 19 to frequent their business because right. they can't get there. So I was, I mean, hope, I was hoping that by now <laughs> we would have gotten through this, uh, mm -hmm. but it's been really slow going since 2016. We, we do have a meeting coming up in the near future to meet with the department and talk about the viability of other alternatives in this quarter. We just haven't gotten there yet. Um, so we can reword the language to, to say we reaffirm that these are important priorities we're just not completely sold on exactly what the project is. So broaden the definition of the solution, but don't move the money. Right. But I just want to leave that with you all as a board that please don't forget about this because this is the only north-south highway that goes to the Pasco County line and it goes through North Pinellas. And, you know, it, we fought long and hard to try to get the improvements so that um, people would have not avoid US-19 and then they go over to East Lake Road and to McMullen Booth and that's now crowded. And so, and if you look at the traffic counts and I brought this up before, the traffic counts on US 19 have gone up, not during COVID, but before COVID, they were drastically up. So people are using it. And I just really want to caution you all, please don't forget that this is a critical project for North County. We're willing to put, and I, and I think it's the right thing to do, but but managed lanes going I-275 to St. Petersburg. And we've 
uh, we've always supported, you know, making sure that, you know, Gandhi Boulevard was improved and, you know, the different things that have happened. So I just hope that you all don't forget this is one county and that we all have to travel the entire county and um, do it efficiently, efficiently, efficiently and safely. Thank you. Yeah, just a comment to follow up. Yes. I totally agree. I mean, it's, it's, if you, it, you don't have to think too long ago and when we had lights from 580 down to 60, you know, and, and I remember going down to the mall down there and it would take you literally half an hour. I mean, it, it was just, it was horrible. And, and it, and it's, and it's gotten that way a little bit as you start to head toward Curlew at night, it, it's backed up halfway to 580. Tampa Road's backed up, you know, a third of the way, half the way down to uh, to Curlew. So, um, and, it, and it was just, it was it was log jammed. I mean, so, and now you can do it in about five minutes, maybe eight minutes, in case somebody's listening, <laughs> that, that if you're going more than 55 miles an hour, <clears throat> that is an issue that we have to look at because people treat that like, a, like the Audubon that somebody mentioned earlier. It's like, it is too fast. But... I do think we have to make sure that we preserve all of our options um, going all the way up to the county line. I mean, I just hate to give, a, give up on any of it. Um, and, and so whatever document we send, more clarification, more flexibility, you know, uh, more openness to keeping things alive as we move forward. I don't, I don't want to, I like you, I don't want to lose any momentum that we've got going there. I think we could also modify the letter a little bit to talk about our up, upcoming long-range plan adoption and that will definitely address the issue of the tarpon interchange as part of that adoption. I think that'll keep us within the window of everything. And we'll keep the flexibility of that could come back as yeah. an option. Yeah, I think that it would be irresponsible of yeah. us not to have that <clears throat> option. Yeah. And, you know, we may at some point have to battle it out with City of Tarpon Springs on there. Hopefully not. Hopefully we'll all get to the same place in the same time frame. But anyway. I'm glad to see that we have our PASCO MPO representative, uh, Carl McKiska, in the room. So PASCO is paying attention to this discussion, too. <laughs> Mayor Bajowski, speaking of PASCO, um, I was just going to say that, you know, I think it was just a couple of years ago, we were hearing how the increased numbers of people moving out of Pinellas into Pasco, but yet still working in Pinellas and the traffic increase that was coming from there. But part of the reason we weren't focusing on Tarpon as much was because Pasco didn't want it. Well, I think the numbers are gonna tell us something completely different, especially with where affordable housing is and the price of housing in Pinellas County now. Mm -hmm. And so I think all of those factors have to be taken into consideration when it's talking about connecting to, to Pasco County. No, Madam Chair, there's not. Is there any, I was asking if there were any citizens that wanted to speak. Hearing none, we need a motion. And do you want it clarified in the motion? I think, I think staff has heard the comments, and I think by consensus we can modify the letter if you're comfortable with, with our ability to do that. Okay. If you would like to make a motion specifically along the lines of your comments, that, that would be fine. I would move to adopt the um, cost feasible plan uh, for the strategic intermodal system with suggested changes to preserving dollars for the US 19 corridor and for um, adjusting the language to reflect that um, you know we're still in the process of planning design and we need some flexibility um, in that regard second okay. and I and I think you know flexibility I was waiting for that word I think that's really important so. everybody's good with that all in favor aye. aye motion carries thank you we will move on to 7e and wit would you like to present on the four Pinellas logistics Sure. Uh, I'll, I'll keep this fairly brief. The uh, Legislative Committee meets generally um, on the um, day of our board meeting at 11 a.m. Uh, to, uh, to take up issues of legislative matters. We typically focus on the state legislative uh, issues. Sometimes we focus on some federal legislative issues as well. 
Um, and it really is meant to focus the board on um, items of interest that might come up either before or during the legislative session. And uh, the committee historically has been um, uh, limited to a number of size, um, but last couple of years we've expanded it to whoever really wants to have an interest in, in coming and spending a whole day here uh, for, for these meetings. And I think the committee has done some really good work in defining our legislative positions, uh, sending letters, um, building a coalition uh, for advocacy, um, and uh, Councilmember Gabbard has chaired that over the last few years. So all today we're asking is um, interest in serving on the legislative committee, and then we will begin meeting in October. At the October meeting, it'll be a bit of an organizational meeting where we will select a chair at that time or recommend a chair, and then the board would affirm that. We would also bring to the committee a set of legislative uh, uh, priorities for consideration, and the committee ideally would bring that back to this board in November or potentially in January, but I think it'd be best if we did it by November. So it would be a pretty quick couple of busy meetings in uh, October and November, and then the legislative session begins in March, so we'd like to have our legislative positions hammered out in January as committee meetings get started. And I think all I really want is just make sure we have an odd number of committee members. <laughs> and it's, we're, and it's we're also definitely odd. <laughs> <laughs> just kidding. It's also a chance that if you are in a, obviously in a city that our staff keeps you abreast on issues that would affect you in your city. So, and you can always bring items that may not quite be in the Ford Pinellas realm, but on the outs, outside of it, which is always a good thing too. So. Um, is there anyone who, who would like to be on Brandy? Okay. This is just a listing of who served previously. I think it's, no, it's th open. It's me. open to whoever. Yeah. Okay, Dave Edgers. Tina, did you get all the names? Did you raise, your hands? raise your hands. Madam Chair, are you still going to be on as well? Well, I can't because I'm leaving. Oh, that's right. Okay. <laughs> You're going twice? <laughs> I have Council Member Gabbard, Commissioner Eggers, Council Member Reed, and Council Member Albritton. That's four. I can survive with four, but it'd be good if we had a fifth. Usually an hour before our meeting. Well, we're fine. Uh, so. And if some, we want to add somebody who's not here, maybe Commissioner Long would consider it. Okay. What, Brandy? We'll be getting some new board members too, correct? That is true. Yes. So maybe we, there'll be opportunity to appoint yeah. others in a month or so? Yes. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Either in okay. January or in October. Okay. And then session starts in March this year. That's right. But committees start Starting in December. January. Oh, I maybe, was, maybe December. Yeah. Maybe you're right. Okay. All right. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to take a motion. Is there a motion to approve? Madam Thank Chair, for the record, there are no members of this uh, public wishing to speak on this item. Thank you. Is there a uh, motion for the Legislative Committee? Move approval. Is there a second? Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion passed. Okay, Director's Report. All right, thank you. Uh, I've got a few items for you today, um, starting with the spotlight update. Uh, I did want to make everybody aware that we've been working with the Town of Indian Shores for quite some time and the Florida Department of Transportation to get a sidewalk built for almost two miles uh, of Gulf Boulevard where we have a, uh, what I think we all agree is a potentially unsafe situation where um, there is an, um, no grade separation between the roadway, Gulf Boulevard, and the sidewalk, which is a shared sidewalk bike path. And uh, Mayor Serrano has been a very uh, active um, uh, advocate for um, improving the safety for pedestrians and, and bicyclists out there because they have noticed that people tend to pass on the right when there is a car stopped trying to find a gap to turn left and a car behind them not familiar with the area could um, 
pass on the right and, and, and do some real damage. Uh, the department has worked diligently with the town to come up with a concept um, for that quarter that the town ad approved. Uh, unfortunately, the preliminary cost estimates came back and uh, there is a five foot uh, easement needed for a right of way uh, to um, address potential flooding issues. And uh, the uh, right of way estimate was approximately $25 million and the construction cost was approximately $15 million. And we started looking at uh, potential for the county to be on the hook for again relocating utilities, which they've already put money to. So we were looking at a potential $60 million sidewalk for less than two miles of roadway. Uh, neither the department nor Forward Pinellas thinks that's a good use of money. Um, especially on a roadway that is not on our high injury road network where we have a ton of um, crashes and fatalities. The potential is there, however. Mm -hmm. So uh, I wanted to let you all know that this is not a done deal. We thought it might have been a done deal until we got this cost estimate back. Uh, the department did present to the town some other options that were less intrusive in terms of right of way that I thought were pretty reasonable. So we do have a meeting that we're, I don't think we finalized exactly because some of the department staff weren't available till after October, uh, early October. Uh, but we are gonna be meeting with the town and with the department staff in a workshop and then take uh, whatever comes out of that workshop back to the town council and hopefully we'll get that cost down to a more manageable level and, and avoid right of way impacts. Um, it's still a priority on our priority list. The department has committed to continuing to work with the town on um, advancing that project as soon as we come up with a viable concept so we don't feel like there's a gun pointed to our head um, to get it into the maybe FY28 uh, year of the work program um, and they're willing to work with us. So I just wanted to make you aware that we hit a little snag with that cost estimate, a $60 million snag, and we um, need to come up with a more cost feasible, cost feasible option. Any questions about that? Department, you good with what I said? Okay. Uh, the next item I wanted to bring to your attention also in the spotlight vein is uh, Christina Mendoza and I met with the Gateway Business Council in um, St. Petersburg um, last maybe what, two weeks ago approximately and we had a really good discussion with the business community out there uh, in Carillon about the potential formation of a transportation management organization that would really engage the business community in working with employers, employees, to define commute options in that area. Uh, they could be first mile, last mile, or they could be long commute options that um, really need to be addressed because the West Shore Interchange is going under construction in a year, and that'll be like six to 10 years of construction of the West Shore Interchange. And uh, with the Howard Franklin Bridge under construction and other projects, it would be good to develop some commute alternatives for folks there. Um, there was generally receptive discussion and we are going to be launching a survey of employers in that area to find out what their needs are and um, look at forming a TMO, um, kind of like the West Shore Alliance has a similar organization over in Tampa. Um, and the downtown St. Pete has one, and downtown Tampa, there are a few around our region. And it really is a vehicle for engaging the business community and helping address transportation needs in a defined area. We don't wanna create another layer of government or another board that nobody will go to, so the St. Pete Chamber has expressed interest in hosting that. Not a done deal, but it's, it's good that they're interested. If we target an area outside of the, of the city of St. Pete, because the gateway covers Largo, Pinellas Park, and unincorporated county, then we might need to think of another vehicle for that. Um, or it could still be the chamber and they might be receptive to, to that. Uh, so it's in the early stages, but I did wanna let you know that we had a pretty uh, good discussion and that's part of the whole gateway master plan implementation. And there's potential funding from FDOT to develop that survey, implement the survey, and then launch a commute options program uh, as part of that. The next item I want to mention is Alt-19 um, Investment Corridor, um, and Christina has also been doing the heavy lifting on this project. Uh, this is a, a, a corridor plan that we're um, underway with the consultant Kimley Horn now. Uh, we are rebranding uh, the Alt-19 Investment Corridor as Advantage Alt-19, Investing in People and Places. 
And uh, we are hosting two upcoming public workshops, and I want to mention October 26th uh, will be from 5 to 7 in Largo at the Sheriff's Office. And the second one will likely be at the St. Pete College campus. Uh, we still have to nail down a date for that workshop. And we are defining those two workshops to really recognize that this is a really long corridor. It's like 16 miles. So the southern one will cater more to the southern part of the corridor and the northern to the northern part of the corridor. We've had study management team that has been meeting and giving us guidance along the way. And I think we have another meeting coming up uh, in the next week or so. Um, so I just wanted to give you a heads up. We'll send you information about those workshops if you're interested in participating. And um, I'm really proud that uh, this work is uh, beginning to um, come to fruition. Any questions about Alt-19? This quarter extends from downtown Clearwater to the Sun Runner uh, in St. Petersburg. And we haven't forgotten, Mayor, about the Northern Alt-19 quarter, too. All right, uh, the next item I want to mention is um, um, two weeks ago, we had a meeting with Amtrak uh, that was hosted by the three MPOs, Pasco, Hillsborough, and Pinellas, and T. Barta was part of that meeting as well. And we really just wanted to find out from Amtrak what their interest is in developing uh, better transportation alternatives in Tampa Bay. Uh, as many of you probably know, we've been in some long discussions about the CSX corridors. So that was kind of a, on the front of our mind is would Amtrak be interested in serving uh, the CSX quarters to Brooksville and to Clearwater, St. Petersburg. Uh, and it was a really interesting discussion. And essentially, Amtrak has a lot more interest in uh, the I-4 corridor, uh, particularly connecting SunRail, uh, which is the Orlando commuter rail line that ends in Poinciana in Osceola County, to Lakeland. Um, there's been a feasibility study that Lakeland, the Polk TPO has looked at and then Amtrak is interested in, in providing service between Lakeland and Tampa's Union Station, and then maybe beefing up the bus service that they run between Pinellas County and Union Station. And they look at that corridor, even though Brightline is theoretically coming to Tampa by maybe 2028, if all goes well. They are constructing a line to Orlando from South Florida. And Amtrak's response to the question I posed to them, you know, could you have high-speed rail and Amtrak in the same corridor. They said the I-4 corridor needs a lot of attention and they think the market is broad enough for a shorter haul commuter service and a longer haul high-speed rail service that Brightline would operate. So that we were a little surprised that that was their focus and they weren't too interested in the CSX lines, but you know, Amtrak uh, continues to kind of be uh, in talks nationwide with, with the freight lines, particularly CSX, and that mobile, mobile to New Orleans line is really what's holding everything up. So until that gets resolved, uh, there's not going to be much movement. Uh, one thing that we learned on the call, though, was Amtrak has a lot of shorter commuter rail specialized services in states like Texas and North Carolina and Virginia and, and about 17 others where there is a state agreement with Amtrak to provide a higher level of service. Florida has no such agreement. Um, so the TMA leadership group will be meeting on September 23rd. The staff directors plan to bring this up. We don't plan to dwell on it too long, but we would like to ask the TMA leadership group if there is interest in this region, kind of like we did for the West Shore Interchange, where we all sent letters and spoke as one voice. Do we want to send a, a letter to the state encouraging um, the state of Florida to at least explore the feasibility of entering into a partnership with Amtrak to look at areas where um, better commuter uh, rail al uh, alternatives could be developed. In West Central Florida, um, the Amtrak folks uh, said they think is ripe for that kind of agreement and they are open to all options and any options that could be considered. So it's about as wide open as it could be right now, but I just wanted to let you know that that would be a request uh, that the TMA leadership group would likely make, and then that would be affirmed by our respective MPOs. Any questions about the Amtrak discussion? It's really preliminary, but I just wanted to make you aware of it. All right. Uh, the last item I'll bring to you is um, um, an update on our budget status. And uh, as you know, this board approved a, um, a millage increase um, that uh, needed to go to the Board of County Commissioners for approval. We learned late in the process that it required a unanimous approval. 
from the Board of County Commissioners, and we were unable to get that last Thursday at the first uh, public hearing, but we did present an alternative lower millage rate that um, did not require a unanimous vote, um, and that millage rate, um, while not uh, making us um, um, our budget whole to where every year we were bringing in uh, as many uh, revenues as we were expending, it gets us significantly closer to that goal and puts us in a much better situation than, than we're currently in. Uh, that millage, um, let's see, I think I have this open here. Um, well, I thought I had it. It was um, 0210 is the proposed new millage rate. Uh, I have a spreadsheet here. I'm not gonna bore you with a whole lot of details, but it results in about a $274,000 um, uh, deficit in our revenues relative to expenditures, but it still results in about a $350,000 um, uh, fund balance moving into FY24, which gives us a little bit of working capital that uh, enables us to be responsive. Um, this was um, uh, passed on the third uh, motion, uh, suggested by Commissioner Gerard, and the board did vote it 5-2. Uh, the, it was a conditional vote, and uh, they will hear it again at the September 22nd public hearing. And I have set up meetings with um, uh, the county commissioners. I met with Commissioner Seal earlier this week. Um, I'll be meeting with Commissioner Peters on Friday, and I have a meeting with Commissioner Eggers that we'll schedule, and um, I'll meet with the other commissioners as necessary. And I think, you know, one of the lessons learned is that um, it, you, re you really need to build uh, these relationships with the commissioners and help them to understand uh, your budget and your issues, and Commissioner Peters pointed that out. Uh, we have tried to get a meeting with Commissioner Peters, and I'm glad we're finally meeting on Friday. Um, so I wanted to update you. This doesn't need to come back to this board for action. It's completely up to the BCC at this time, and I do think we have a workable solution that um, will keep us whole, will keep us uh, being responsive, and will, con and will incorporate the proposed salary increases for our staff, which I know this board felt very strongly about and advocated for, and I appreciate that. And I know our staff does as well. So if you have any questions for me, I'm happy to address them, but I just wanted to give you that status update. Yes. I have a question on something else. Okay. Sure. What's the status of our waterborne transportation plan? Well, Commissioner Eggers asked that in the budget discussion, and I think uh, essentially we left it a little bit open that if we could find consensus, uh, that that could be something that the county commission addresses during the budget year. I think that was the direction and the feedback you got from, from the county administrator. I think there was a little bit of a mischaracterization that we did not bring forward a plan, which I took issue with. We, yeah, we, we, we brought, brought a plan forward, forward a full-on plan in <laughs> February. Uh, yeah, I think the county administrator Absolutely, we feels did. that um, the amount we're requesting from the county is not in line with what he thinks the county's obligation should be. Um, but I did point out to him that if we did the same thing for the city of Dunedin, that your contribution would be vastly lower. If we did the same thing for Clearwater, your contribution would be vastly lower. So I think what we proposed was fair, and I'm open to any feedback. Uh, the administrator did commit to going with me to amplify Clearwater, to going to the beach businesses, because one of his precedents for investing county funds would be he wants to see private dollars invested first. So that's a conversation we'll continue to have. But that's the status of that. Okay, so... Uh, let me say this. I was at the meeting with Witt. Yeah, and I couldn't be there. I'm sorry. I was on. I was out of town, or I, I would have. I missed you very much, but I anyone, would have. You know, I would have been yeah, there. Yeah, no. I. Um, you can speak to any of the commissioners that are not county commissioners that are not on this agency about this. So I would recommend that maybe having a conversation. I will, but I also think that we need to have another waterborne transportation committee meeting. Yes. For for strategy purposes, and I wouldn't say months from now. I would okay. say soon. Okay. Because and we, can do we, that. we need to, we need to be able to talk openly and honestly and next steps. Because I can tell you that my chamber is not going to put money towards this. They're not. My businesses aren't. They they tried to do that for the trolley. And it it failed miserably. And the county certainly supported the trolley. This is just another 
small thing. And, and by the way, ARPA money can be used for that until we can figure out I think it's that future we funding. want it for three years. That's it's not As that the it's test. A, yeah, and, it's, the, and it has, I understand that, but I'm telling you that that's my perception, um, that it's because it's the three years. But all, that being said, again, I, I would appreciate it if each one of you would reach out to your county commissioners because they can make that happen, you know, that we would like to see that, you know. And Commissioner Edgars ex did explain it. He spoke about it at the meeting. And um, I, th I think that the county commissioners n need to know that, you know, this is part of our agenda, that we do have a plan. We have given the plan. So that was not correct statement. And, you know, we're not going to get into it. So an let's argument. get a whole, let's get our waterborne transportation committee back together as soon as humanly possible. Okay. Thank you. Okay. okay. Thank you. We'll do that. Yeah. Can I just Ready? Any other? You could comment yes. on it? Yeah. I, I, I mean, I think there's hope. I don't think we've, I mean, Commissioner Seal, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think we've really dived into this much at all. I mean, we passed money for that trans, that, waterborne effort from St. Pete to Tampa right. uh, for a few years and and had less discussion. I mean, had more discussion on that and we didn't have a lot on that and it happened. We haven't had that much discussion on this as a group. So I do think there's interest on the commission to have to dive into it a little bit to understand it better and to consider it. And 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 I saw so I said so what are we going to do if we decide we want to do it and and so we'll find the money to do it. Uh, and I said, you know, they're looking for three to five year commitment. So, um, so I, I think there's appetite. I'm, I'm not going to speak for the other commissioners. I learned a long time ago I don't do that. <laughs> but I do, I do think there's some appetite to, to have the discussion. So, and, you know, yeah. Commissioner I mean, Sue, you one of the things that I wanna, we had, an, we put a committee together. We have been in that committee for over a year working on this. Two. So, I mean, or two. Two. So my point being is, is it's not like that. The, many people that are on this board were on that committee so I mean it's not like we it's not like you know we, we had just came up with yes, it that's well and maybe uh, at the meeting we can discuss you know getting on a workshop agenda of the county commission and and as a as a committee presenting obviously with wit leading but presenting to the entire commission I think a workshop request makes a lot of sense um, yeah, I did point out to the county administrator and others that, you know, and my numbers may be off, but essentially we're spending about $55 million a year to lure and entice visitors and future residents to this county. And we're not putting really any money into uh, managing that demand and addressing that issue going over to Clearwater Beach. And there's a role we all play uh, in this. And I think the leadership of the county is important. The two cities have already stepped up. Uh, but if you don't have that third partner, it, the deal kind of falls apart. And PSTA has got 100,000 in state of good repair as part of that deal. And we presented that in November to the county and then again in February. And so um, it was well in advance of the budget. And we're asking for $200,000 from the county. Uh, essentially, we're asking for 450,000 in operating expense over a three year period. However, that breaks down between the city and cities and, and the county, we're open. Um, so I don't want it to lose momentum either, and I'm glad we have a champion on this board. We had PSTA really kind of pushing to, um, to, to come to the rescue of the private operator, and uh, Cassandra has left, so I'm a little worried that we won't have that same momentum from PSTA, so it may take some leadership from this board. It was 450 per year for three years. 450 per year for three right. years. And right. that, you had said over three years, and I just want to make sure. I meant sure. over a three year period. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. Yes, thank so, you. So it's a. Over it's a, a relatively a, modest. 1.3 1. 1. million for the yeah. three years. And nobody expects the water taxi to solve the congestion problems of the Memorial Causeway Bridge, but it gives people one more option. It gives workers another option. Um, and um, I think we do have some park and ride opportunities that we can work on in both Dunedin and in. Uh, Clearwater. Yeah. So I will leave it at there, but your point's well taken, Mayor. Thank you. Is there anyone else who has anything to say on this, or you're all good? Okay. With um, the December meeting, just so that they have it on their calendar.
Yeah, that, there's a reminder, it's in the packet. Okay. Um, we, we are planning a workshop for December 14th. Uh, we will get an agenda to you shortly. We have um, a draft agenda that we're working on. Um, we are invite. We are going to be inviting some of the mayors from around the county, and the focus is on things that we can work together on uh, as priority for the for the county. Anything else you'd like to add for that? No, I think that's great. I did want to mention that I was down in St. Pete, um, and if anyone hasn't had a chance to see the Rise Monument that was unveiled, it was fabulous. I got there right after they were unveiling it, and uh, Commissioner. Uh, Driscoll, it was awesome. I, you have to see it. It has to do with the 9-11, and it's just, it's amazing, creative, just majestic piece of artwork. You really have to see it to, to, to really get what it looks. It's just amazing, I'm just telling you. So hopefully you'll get down there. One final thing from me, uh, I do want to draw your attention to the October 14th workshop that we have planned for safety. It is uh, really to move the needle on safety in, in Pinellas County. Yep. It's being hosted by us, but the District 7 uh, Department of Transportation uh, is really facilitating the workshop. And that's an elected officials workshop, but I wanna clarify, because I've gotten a couple of emails from city managers and chamber representatives. It's really open to anybody who's not a technical engineer or planner, because we have another meeting for those folks um, where they can kind of relate as peers uh, but this is meant for anybody who's interested. And, you know, um, tragically, we had three pedestrian fatalities in one day uh, a couple of weeks ago, including a uh, 15-year-old high school student yep. in Largo High. And, um, you know, we have a problem. And, um, you know, I'm tired of these fatalities. I'm tired of these serious injuries. And I really want to move the needle on it as much as anybody. So I would encourage you to be there because... You know, unfortunately, some of the things that we think about for safety and look at for safety um, mean that we have to change the nature of our roadways. And that might mean that there's a few more seconds of delay on our roadways, or it might mean that there's a little bit more money that we need to spend on lighting, or it might mean that we need to get some crosswalks installed. And um, not everybody's gonna be happy with all those changes, but safety is should be our first priority. Yeah, I, and I just wanted to comment on, thank you for bringing that up, Whit, because I, I really think it is one of one of our major yep. responsibilities um, as elected officials to take a look at this safety issue. Um, thinking outside the box, and it, you know, it's, so, it's such a big county, you start to think, well, how do we do it all? And I remember, I always go back to, like in Dunedin, and Bob Ironsmith said, you just do one uh, little piece of a block at a time to get your, your downtown to grow into something special. But you, if you looked at it as a big picture, you'd never get there. And um, I really think, you know, that corridor on Bel Air is a speed corridor for a lot of reasons. It's a connector more now than ever before. And we need to just think outside the box. I talked to our transportation folks, Tom Washburn, just to, you know, he's not even tasked with anything yet, but just, we need to think of creative ideas to, mm -hmm. to stop this stuff. And we have a situation up on Nebraska where somebody else is seeing a lot of kids going, walking to high school at 6.30 in the morning and it's dark, mm -hmm. and county roads don't have lights. So they're just, and they're, they're not all like, like good little stewards walking down to one intersection. They just cross wherever you know, they want to. So we've gotta figure out some ways to, to minimize this. We have the roundabout going in and on Alt 19, and there's half the people that are thinking, oh my gosh, what are you doing? And I tell them, it's all about safety. There's that two block area you've got to slow the traffic down. You don't slow it down. You've got so many businesses and interaction with the trail and the business. And we have golf cart crossings now, and it's just a mess. And if you don't slow it down, we're going to have more of the accidents and the deaths. And the so we got to start taking these, these little, little challenges on one at a time and, and start making a difference. And we don't need that we can getting compared to New York City um, no. on tra transportation deaths. So, no, that's a, anyway, thank, thank you, you for bringing that thank up. You. There isn't any more information. This board is adjourned. Thank you for Thank coming you. and have a great week. You too. Month.